Well, good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you to our live stream for Grace Community Bible Church. It's a joy to have you with us. If you've joined us on the stream tonight, then uh, uh, we are certainly thankful for you. And so what we're going to do is go back to Matthew chapter uh, 6 um, to uh, look at some a passage in verses 25 to 34 about worry. And I think it's appropriate at this time because so many people... Uh, not only in our community, but across the world, are worrying. They are concerned about what is happening with the coronavirus and, and other sicknesses that are out there. And, and there seems to be a mass hysteria uh, globally. And, uh, and, and obviously there's some reason for concern. There's some reason uh, to be prepared. But, uh, but by and large, I think that many people are uh, overly... Uh, concerned and panicked uh, into a point of just hysteria. And uh, so we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. Over in the New Testament, we have uh, passages as well that give us confidence, but one that I want to focus on tonight, and I've already asked you to turn there, Matthew chapter 6, uh, verses 25 to 34 is the text, and I want to read it for you, and then we can uh, uh, dive into this passage together. Matthew chapter 6 Verse 25 reads in this way, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried. Don't be worried about your life as to what you will eat uh, or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And in verse 28, it asks this, And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all of his glory clothed himself like one of these. Uh, but if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Verse 31, do not worry then, saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. In verse 33, a great promise, but seek ye first the kingdom, his kingdom, and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. In verse 34, so do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the, the opportunity to go through this text tonight, uh, to look at the great hope and the promise that we have in you, that you are our provider, you are sovereign, you are in control of all things, and that we do not have to worry. Uh, there's no uh, coronavirus or any uh, problem that we might face that would uh, remove you from the throne. You are in control and you are sovereign and we rejoice. We rejoice that our hope is in you, our faith and trust is in you, and it is a hope and a faith and a trust that's properly placed in you. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. As we look to this text, we see that, that uh, all of these things for which these, uh, that, that we're told not to worry about are things that are temporal. And over the past few weeks, we have seen the growing hysteria, not only in our community, but throughout uh, the country as a whole. We've seen the vast majority of people in a, in a, a condition of panic. They're in panic mode. And a simple trip to the grocery store will reveal uh, the fact that many are buying up just about everything that they can find. There's worry, there's hysteria, there's panic. And the things that used to be so common are now in short supply. Many are stocking up and hoarding materials in, in the event that they might need it while there are many others who are without. Uh, many food items have become scarce in the grocery stores and things like toilet paper and hand sanitizer, uh, which used to be readily available, are not to be found in many places. 
And all of this reminds me of the words of Habakkuk in chapter 3 of his writing. We read this in Habakkuk 3 verses 17 to 19. Habakkuk says, though the fig tree should not blossom and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Verse 19, a great uh, testimony of faith and confidence here. The Lord God is my strength and he has made my feet like hinds feet and has and he makes me walk on my high places. And we have that confidence and that hope, the same confidence that Habakkuk had that when all is uh, falling apart and it looks like things are uh, dreary, so to speak, and and people wonder if they can have hope. Habakkuk gives us that confidence that, yes, we can have hope because our God is our strength. When we look at Matthew chapter six, uh, verse twenty four. We see that our Lord begins this section with a phrase that causes us to look backwards in the text. He says in uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, for this reason. Well, if we see that for this reason, we've got to wonder what's he talking about? What reason? And it causes us to look backwards in the text and consider the, the nature of the preceding verse. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 says this, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. And we say, well, why is that important? Why is it important that that, that provides for us the foundation for the text in verses 25 to 34? Well, verse 24 deals with the topic of materialism. Materialism. God doesn't want us to be materialistic. He, he wants us to be those who view our finances and the resources that God has given us uh, to spread the gospel message and to bless those who are in need. He doesn't want us to be materialistic and clinging tightly to uh, our money or to our finances or to things that we uh, hold dear. He's not opposed to us having things and having wealth and having all of these blessings, he just doesn't want those blessings to have us. He's, he's okay if you have money. He just doesn't want money having you. And the same could be true for all of those who are using this crisis, this coronavirus crisis, as an opportunity to stockpile uh, supplies for uncertain days ahead. Do we have un uncertain days? Absolutely. And there's nothing wrong with making sure that we have an adequate supply uh, for days of uncertainty. I don't want you to hear the wrong thing, uh, but there is definitely something wrong with placing your hope in that stockpile. Uh, as we face these trials, our hope must be in the one who is our provider and not in the things that he has provided. As we turn the corner into uh, verse 25 then, the Lord is building upon uh, that notion to encourage his uh, hearers not to engage in uh, worry. It seems that the microphone died here, so we're going to replace the batteries real quick. We just put in new batteries about an hour ago. Thank you, Pastor Henry. Are we back on? Okay, well good. As we uh, look at verse 25 then, we see that uh, the Lord is building upon the notion uh, here to encourage His, His hearers not to engage in any worry. It's interesting to see the contrast between these two passages. The passage on materialism, which was essentially verses 16 to 24 of Matthew 6, it dealt with uh, those who have financial provisions, those who have plenty. Uh, but here in verses 25 to 34, he's dealing with those who have very little. It could be said that the first passage is for those who are abounding, those who abound, and the second passage is for those who are abased. 
And those who abound in much, those who have financial uh, blessings and financial resources are often tempted to trust in those resources and to trust in their wealth and, and their possessions. And to the contrary, uh, those who don't have wealth and resources are often prone to doubt the provision of God. Uh, they doubt uh, whether or not He will come through for them. The rich sometimes relish in their riches while the poor are rich in worry. And why the teaching on finances here as we look at the first portion of Matthew chapter 6? Why does the Lord spend time there dealing with His disciples uh, covering principles of money? Uh, well, aren't Christians supposed to have money all figured out? After all, we serve uh, the God who gives us our money. Aren't we supposed to have, be the ones that have all the answers? Well, we're not. And our Lord teaches on this simply because we need to hear it. The teaching on money is one of the, the most prominent subjects in all of Scripture. Uh, and we know that Dr. MacArthur's commentary records that 16 of the 38 parables deal with money. One out of ten verses in the New Testament deals with uh, that subject of stewardship. And, and Scripture offers about 500 verses on prayer, um, fewer than 500 on faith, uh, and, and over 2,000 verses on money. And this is why we must have a good understanding of what our Lord says about money. And the passage that we're looking at tonight, though, verses 25 to 34 deals not with the topic of money, but the topic of worry and how we shouldn't engage in worry. Worry means this. It means to give way to anxiety or unease, to allow one's mind to dwell on the difficult, uh, uh, on, on difficult things or the troubles in which they find themselves. Worry for the believer is the sin of distrusting the providence of God. And yet it is a sin that, that Christians commit perhaps more than any other. In these verses, the Lord invo invokes the term worry six times to show the importance of it. And one commentator I read uh, referred to worry as this. He says, worry is practical atheism. If you want to uh, know what atheism is like, just remove uh, God from the picture. Remove God uh, from uh, your life and from uh, any, uh, any type of prayer or anything. And he said, and that's what you're doing, in, in essence, when you worry. It's practical atheism. It's an affront to God. And you see that in uh, the New American Commentary. And so I want to give you three points tonight to give us hope and confidence in the, the fact that God is able to meet the needs for any crisis, any, any problem in which we find ourselves. He is God, and He is still God on the throne, and this crisis does not uh, thwart His plans. Uh, and that's what we will talk about uh, here tonight. The first point is this, because God is the provider, He is able because God is the provider, He is able. We've been teaching through Matthew's Gospel, as I mentioned, for about almost four years now. A few years ago, as I was teaching through this chapter in particular, I mentioned several times, uh, and even mentioned earlier tonight, that, that uh, the Lord doesn't have a problem with us having things. He just doesn't want the things to have us. He's not opposed to us having riches. He just doesn't want the riches having us. And this is evidenced by the fact that even in the time of Christ, there were many uh, believers in Christ who were genuinely wealthy. That's not the issue. It's not whether or not we have uh, resources uh, or it, it's not whether or not the wealth has become um, uh, something that we have. It's do we place our hope in it? Do we place our trust in the resources? Have these, wealth, these items of uh, blessing that we've been given become that which is our uh, security? Is it our source of security? Think of Job for a moment. Job is one who had everything, a very wealthy man. Uh, and, and he was by all accounts uh, a man of great wealth and he lost it all in one day. Think about that. Everything that Job had, everything that he was clinging tightly to was taken in a day. He, he, there, there are many stories of great men, Christian men, who have amassed great amounts of wealth and who have lost it all 
in short order. What happens then? Well, it becomes difficult for someone who trusts in their riches to go through a great trial uh, like what Job went through or, or any trial like that or even a trial like this coronavirus. Uh, it, it becomes difficult for someone who trusts in their riches to go through that, assuming that they are a believer, because it forces them to reevaluate their source of security or uh, the source of their assurance. Are they secure because they are trusting in their riches? Or are they secure because they are uh, trusting in God? David is a man that I think of. David was a man of great wealth. After all, he was a king. Uh, but even uh, he said, I know where my help comes from. David was confident uh, that his uh, Lord was his God. And he says this in, in Psalm 18, you are my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. He knew where his confidence was placed, but did he trust his uh, riches? No. Was he perfect? No. But for the most part, with the exception of David's uh, Bathsheba moment, he endeavored to live a life that was dependent upon the Lord. At this point, we don't know exactly uh, how this coronavirus is going to go. We know that here we are uh, speaking through live stream because our church is shut down uh, for several weeks. And we don't know how this is going to go. We, we don't know with any degree of certainty. Uh, but, but what we do know is this, is that the word of God is not trumped by our circumstances. The provision of our Lord is not trumped by our circumstances. The word of God is not stopped by the coronavirus. Never in the history of the world has there been a problem that was outside the realm of God's ability to handle. Never. And He absolutely, positively can handle any situation that we face, including the one that you currently find yourself in and the one that we currently as a congregation find ourselves in. And the question is one of strength and assurance. In your current situation, whatever you may be going through in your life, do you find your strength and your assurance in yourself? Or is it in your preparedness? It is, is it in your riches? Is it in your stockpile of groceries? Is it in your own personal ability to remedy your situation? You might say, well, I'm a man of means and I can do uh, all that is needed for my family. And you're trusting in yourself. Or do you trust in God alone to be your source of strength and your provision. Uh, I would admit to you that this is an area even in my own life that I've failed many times. And I would venture to say that you have failed as well in this area. I don't think that any one of us can say that uh, from the time of our walk with Christ, when it began, when we surrendered our lives to the Lord, I don't think that any of us can say that we have always in every moment trusted God for everything, for all our provision all the time. No, there's moments where we've doubted. There are times that we've wondered, how are we going to make ends meet? Uh, we're not to believe that Christians are mysteriously given uh, the, the instantaneous ability to forsake care and worry. No, we're still human. We are prone to do that. When we face challenging situations, we uh, sometimes worry even if we are a believer. It would be nice to, to not deal with that, but friends, that's not always the case. A trust in Him is built. A trust like that is built over time, walking with God and seeing His faithful provision in uh, moment after moment uh, and year after year you get to the point where you finally understand and recognize that, that uh, I know that He's going to get me through because He's done it so many times in the past. His Word is faithful. His, his promises are sure. Sure, and I can trust in him. So in Matthew 6, 25, he says this, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried. Do not be worried. And then he goes on to talk about the areas of worry. He said, don't be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? As we get into uh, verses 26 to 30, the Lord gives uh, three illustrations of His provision and care for both uh, animate objects and inanimate objects. And the first has to do with His provision for one part of His creation. 
And I like that he uh, puts this in, in the, uh, the text for us to enjoy. But look at verse 26. He starts to talk about birds. Look at verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. Uh, that they don't sow, they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? Friends, that's a great question to ask your, yourself and to consider that even in your own heart. Are you not worth much more than they? Are you not worth infinitely more than the birds? This verse was one of the, the favorites of a preacher by the name of John Stott, a preacher with, uh, with whom many of you are familiar. It was one of his favorites because John Stott was an avid bird watcher. And uh, he said this in his treatment of this verse in the Greek, he saw that it begins with, with an imperative statement. And the imperative statement in the Greek translates in this way, watch birds. And as a bird watcher, he was delighted to see that. And so he did. He noticed some things, though. There, he says in his text, there are millions and millions of birds. And by and large, they are healthy and they are happy. And none of them are suffering hypertension. None are suffering stress-related diseases. And certainly none of them are worrying. And God takes care of them, even though unlike us, they don't sow or reap. And God will take care of us, too. And that's the obvious meaning. And what a joy to, to read that and to see that. I remember even back in my uh, days in seminary, one of my professors, Professor Montoya, uh, woke up one day and was listening to the birds. And he said, well, this is strange. I hear birds singing. And, and this is weird because this is L.A. He said, birds don't sing. They cough here. Uh, but, but this is L.A. And he said, and birds are singing. And it reminded him of this passage that the birds aren't worried. The birds aren't concerned. Uh, they're not dealing with any uh, hypertension or stress-related diseases. None of them are worrying how they're going to find their next meal. Uh, they just uh, rest in the faithful provision of our Lord. But the question is, when we look at this text, then does that mean that we don't do anything? Does that mean that we just sit back and we don't prepare? Does that mean that we wait on God to provide? Uh, no, just like the birds are diligent to prepare, so should we. We should prepare. If God cares so much uh, for the lowest of creatures, then why would we think even for a moment uh, that, that, that He wouldn't care infinitely more for us? He gives us the understanding to know that uh, we are to do these things, that we should prepare. Uh, think of this about the birds. Another element here is to think that birds don't necessarily have a relationship with the Father like we do. We have a relationship with the Father. We are created in His image. The birds aren't said to be created in His image. Uh, he calls us to Himself. He calls us His own. In fact, the Word says that He calls us His own special possession. We are His children. You think that He cares for you more than the birds? Uh, absolutely, He cares more for you than He does for the birds. And He will provide for you just as He provides for them. Look at verse 27, Matthew 6, 27. And, and who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? I like what R. Kent Hughes says in his commentary. He says this, Not a single hour will be added to your life by worry, but, dear friends, many hours can be lost from enjoying the things with which he has already Bless you. Are you spending your time worrying? Are you out rejoicing in the faithfulness and the goodness of our Lord? Now look at the next verse, uh, verse 28, Matthew 6, uh, 28. I'll read 29 also. And it says this, And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin, Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. You see, God, in his gracious provision, he not only clothes the, the birds, but he also clothes the fields and he clothes them with, with beautiful flowers. And if he cares that much about the fields and he cares that much about the birds to clothe them, then how much more does he care about you? 
Martin Luther, in a very humorous way, was writing on this verse, and, and he says this, It seems that the flower stands there and makes us blush, and it becomes our teacher. And he writes this, he says, Thank you, flowers, you who are to be devoured by the cows. God has exalted you very highly, that you become our masters and our teachers. You see, God uses even the flowers to teach us of His faithful provision. And then he turns his attention to Solomon, whose great wealth was widely known. We could go back to the previous section, verses 16 to 24, and to talk about wealth. Uh, Solomon here uh, certainly would have been well-dressed. He would have been well provided for. And our Lord said that even in his finest clothes, Solomon could not compare with the lowliest of flowers uh, that the Lord had clothed. Now, now there's no verse uh, really that speaks to the garments of Solomon, but we know that uh, in 1 Kings chapter 3, uh, verse 13, we know that his glory is spoken of, it says, and it's only natural to assume that, to, to assume that his wardrobe would have been matching. In 1 Kings Chapter 3, verse 13, we see this. I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there will uh, not be any among the kings like you all your days. It's interesting that Matthew makes reference to Solomon. In fact, Matthew makes reference to Solomon five times, uh, which is more than any other New Testament book. And the point is that King Solomon was known for magnificence, but as magnificent as he was, uh, he could not compare to one single flower that was clothed by God. So does God care for the, for the birds? Absolutely. Does he care for the flowers? You bet. But you know, he cares more for you. And for that reason, we don't have to be worried. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 30. Matthew 6, 30 reads in this way, but if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith, he says. Friends, why do we doubt? Uh, why do we worry? Why do we get so anxious? It's it, because we like to, to have control of the situation. We like to have a control of our circumstances. We like to have control of our lives so much that we get fearful when we lose that control. And many people are fearful at this time. Many people are fearful because they can't control their situation. Uh, but who's the one who can? Who's the one who can control the situation? Is God not able... Is God not able to supply all of your needs? Is God not able to protect you and sustain you? Is God not able to clothe you and to give you your provision? Certainly He is. Certainly He's able. And as children of the King, we can be certain that He cares about every need that we have. He's fully aware of our needs. He's fully aware of our circumstances. And He cares about every trial that we face. And know this, friends, He's aware of your health needs. He's aware of the challenges that you face. He's aware of the coronavirus. And not only is He aware of it, think of it this way, He's in charge of it. He's in charge of it. If we truly believe, dear friends, that God is sovereign, then we have to understand that not only is He in charge and in control of the coronavirus, He ordained it. He ordained it. If He didn't, then He's not sovereign. But we know that He is sovereign. He is sovereign and He is in control. The first point was this, because God is the provider, He is able. Because God is the provider, He is able. The second point is this, because God knows your need, He is aware. Because God knows your need, He's aware. Look at verse 31, Matthew 6, 31. Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? Verse 32, For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. We see that this is the second time in the passage where the Lord gives the command not to worry. In this passage, it's interesting, verse, uh, verses 31 and 32 
Really, in verse 32, the word Gentiles is used here, but it's used in a way to indicate uh, those who are unbelievers. And he speaks of them as being those who eagerly seek for these things. They overestimate the significance of these things. They put too high of a price tag on these items of food and drink and clothing because in that day they were seen as a status symbol, uh, something that uh, would cause others to look at, at them. But we're not to stress over these things, wondering how are we uh, to get these things. We trust in the provision of the Lord. Now think for a moment of how stressful life can be for people like that. Think of that. The Gentiles, as they are referred to here, have no father to turn to. You have to remember that Matthew was writing uh, to Jewish believers or, or to, to, to prove the, the deity of the king. And so they, he references Gentiles here as being those who were unbelievers. Now we know because of the new covenant that uh, the Gentiles are welcomed in. And, and so we have a father to turn to. Uh, some of us, we don't have to go back far in our memory though to think of a time in which we didn't have a father, a heavenly father, and a time in our life when we were an unbeliever. But as a believer, you have a heavenly father. And what does that mean in this context? It means that you're not alone. Uh, he says this in verse 32, The Gentiles eagerly seek for these things, but your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. And here we, we understand that we are of the believing community and we understand that he knows our needs. We're not alone. And it means that we have an advocate. We have a provider. We have someone in our corner, uh, so to speak, watching out for us, careful and, uh, and, and uh, diligent to care for us, making sure that our needs are met. And it is our Heavenly Father. God the Father cares for you. So, so it's not only that is He aware that you have a need, but He knows exactly what you need. He knows what you need today. He knows what you'll need tomorrow. He knows what you'll need next month. It doesn't matter. Think about it this way. Did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurs to Him? Or did it, did it ever dawn on you that nothing ever dawns on Him? He knows the end from the beginning. He knows, and more than that, He cares. And even more than that, He's able. He's willing. He's prepared. And He's working on your case Right now, what a tremendous comfort that is. The first point was this, that because God is the provider, He is able. The second point was because God knows your need, He is aware. And the third point tonight is this, because God holds the future, He is ready. How then should we live as believers in God? The Lord answers that in verse 33, Matthew 6:33. It's the key verse for this passage. And it says this, But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. What does that mean? Now, seeking His kingdom first means uh, that we are focused primarily on uh, His will and His way and His timing uh, for His glory. It, it means focusing on the spread of the gospel message and on living lives of righteousness that will further His kingdom principles. That's what it means. Living in light of eternity. Well, what does that look like? Well, from the beginning of chapter 5, uh, we see that, that chapter 5 gives a great illustration of how we are to live. It's in the Beatitudes. Chapter 6 also shows us uh, in the way that our Lord uh, contrasts the actions of believers uh, with those of the hypocritical Pharisees. And it's very much reminiscent of what we see in chapter 5, verse 6. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6 says this, that blessed are those who hunger and who thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Well, we have to ask ourselves the question, are we focused on the spread of the gospel message then? Are we hungering and thirsting for righteousness? Do we find our satisfaction in what the Lord provides? Are we engaged in His kingdom priorities? Then we know that we will be satisfied. That's the promise. Jesus is clearly saying that the disciples' first and best effort is to be directed towards God, toward God's kingdom, not 
to any personal needs. Friends, we have people in this day running about trying to stockpile everything that they can so that they will have sufficient provision for the days ahead. But And while there's nothing wrong with being prepared, our hope and our confidence should be in God alone, not in the things that we are able to accumulate for ourselves. Uh, he goes on, to speak to uh, this in the passage, our, our first and best effort is to be directed towards God's kingdom, not any personal needs, you, be, because the kingdom has both a present and a future significance, and we uh, should seek to exclude neither from the passage. What does this mean? It means that the kingdom points to the rule and to the expression of God is to be understood in the terms of doing the will of God now as well as coming to look for the fruition in His final kingdom. So it's got a now and a not yet uh, fulfillment here. But we live in light of that. We live for that, for His glory and for His kingdom. That's the pursuit of our minds. That's the goal of our heart, to live for Him, to honor Him, to worship Him, to work for Him, and to reflect Him well. Look at verse 34, Matthew 6, 34. So He says it again here. So do not worry. Do not worry. All the way through this passage, we see these words. Do not worry. He goes on to say about tomorrow. For tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Friends, I don't know about you, but I've got enough things to think about today. I don't need to be thinking about tomorrow's trouble. Trouble is guaranteed. We can expect trouble. Uh, trouble is sure to come. Uh, the question is, how do we respond? I think of Job and the trouble that he went through. And, and he says in Job chapter 5, verse 7, about the assurance that we have that we will encounter trouble. He says this, for man is born for trouble. As sure as sparks fly upward. Are you going to have trouble? Absolutely. But who of us by worrying can escape the trouble that is to come? None of us can. Kent Hughes says in his commentary, we're not to worry about a tomorrow. Worry will not destroy tomorrow's trials, but it will sabotage our strength. Think about that. If you're spending time worrying about tomorrow's trials then you're sabotaging your own strength. George MacDonald puts it this way, no man ever sank under the burden of the day. No man ever sank under the burden of the day. He said it's when tomorrow's burden is added to the burden of today that the weight is more than a man can bear. The worrying does not in enable you to escape evil. It doesn't make today's trials any lighter. It makes you unfit to cope with tomorrow. And the truth is, we've always, we always have the strength to bear the trouble when it comes, but we don't have the strength to bear worrying about it. Worrying. I remember a preacher one time that used to tell me worrying is like a rocking chair. It keeps you busy, but you don't go anywhere. And if you add today's troubles to tomorrow's troubles, you give yourself an impossible burden. Friends, don't worry. Don't worry. The anxious heart receives all kinds of blows uh, through uh, this, this anxiety of anticipation that will never happen. And some of us have suffered much more in this world by worrying about what would happen to us than what actually happens. We fear things because uh, things are possible. We fear disease and we fear sickness and we fear poverty and we fear these things because we know that they are possible. But our confidence really should be in the Lord who is our deliverer. Such a heart of one who fears all these things possesses nothing even though it may have everything. Ask those who are rich. Ask those who are wealthy and those who have an abundance of resources. Uh, they still many times worry, do I have enough? Do I have enough? I remember uh, one time Rockefeller was asked, how much, how much money do you need? And he said, oh, just one dollar more. Just one dollar more. I just need one more. And, and that idea is, the, is, the, is, is of one who trusts in his money and trusts in his wealth and friends, we're supposed to trust in God and to place our hope in Him. Uh, Jesus' counsel here is so beautiful. He says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. 
For tomorrow will worry about itself. Every day has enough trouble of its own. So stop worrying. Anxiety is futile. Don't borrow trouble from tomorrow to bring it into today. Well, the question then, how can we do this? Well, verse 33 is the answer. Verse 33 in our text, seek first. You see, in the Greek, this is in the uh, present imperative, uh, which means that we are to be in a continual quest for God's kingdom and God's righteousness. This means be seeking first. Be seeking a continual thing. When you and I do this, our focus is no longer on what we're going to wear, on what we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, and we are uh, then liberated from the blight of anxiety. If we constantly seek Him, there will be no room for the lesser matters. If we are concerned with pleasing Him and honoring Him and furthering His kingdom, then we uh, won't care about all of the lesser things. They will pale in comparison uh, to Him. The cares of the day will flee. Uh, consider the birds and the flowers as the text has done so eloquently. If God cares for the lesser, then what will He do for the greater? If God cares for the birds, what will He do for you? If God cares for the plants, what will He do for you, the one that He has adopted into His family? Friends, don't live in the future. Don't live worrying. Live now. Don't spend your time worrying over what will happen with the coronavirus. Don't spend time worrying over these things. God has given you this day and this hour to serve Him and to please Him. And we can live for Him now and we can serve Him now and please Him now. And we can, we can live for Him and by using this opportunity to rejoice in His faithful provision, in His abundant love, in His mercy that's new every morning, in His grace that's sufficient, in His compassion that never fails, and we can share the good news of His gospel with others. We don't have to worry, friends. I want to close this. So friends, let's do our part to communicate to others that we don't have to worry at this time, but we can place our full hope and confidence in the very one who knows the end from the beginning. We can trust in the very one who is sovereign, who ordains all things that come to pass. If you're tempted to worry, if you're tempted to be stressed over the current circumstances at this time, remember the promise that we have in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, the promise that says this, the steadfast of mind, the steadfast of mind you will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. Friends, does that uh, define you this evening? Does that describe you? Are you steadfast of mind? Are you one who is focused intently on the kingdom? Or are you one who is carried about and, and, and knocked around with the cares of the world, worrying day to day? Or do you place your trust in Him. It's a great uh, thing to consider tonight, and I would say to all of you, the members of Grace Community Bible Church, and even those who are not our members, those who may just be watching. So friends, let's do our part to communicate to others that we don't have to worry at this time, but we can place our full hope and confidence in the very one who knows the end from the beginning. We can trust in the very one who is sovereign, who ordains all things that come to pass. If you're tempted to worry, if you're tempted to be stressed over the current circumstances at this time, remember the promise that we have in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, the promise that says this, the steadfast of mind, the steadfast of mind you will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. Friends, does that uh, define you this evening? Does that describe you? Are you steadfast of mind? Are you one who is focused intently on the kingdom? Or are you one who is carried about and, and, and knocked around with the cares of the world, worrying day to day? Or do you place your trust in Him? 
It's a great uh, thing to consider. But know this, dear friends, God is still on the throne. And this coronavirus, this uh, setback, as some might call it, in the sense that we're not able to uh, be together for a number of weeks, this does not change God's plan. This does not change God's will for the church. He is still on the throne, and there is no need to worry. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we will close. Our Father, we do thank You for Your love for your mercy, for your kindness and goodness. We are thankful that you have uh, been so faithful and good to us. We understand that you are sovereign and we understand that you are in control of all things and we have great confidence in that. That we don't know what tomorrow may hold, but we know who holds tomorrow. And we thank you that our confidence is in you. Our confidence is rightly placed in you and we can have hope because of that. We can trust because of that, we can have joy because of that. We may not know uh, at times uh, where our provision, uh, what, what that may look like, but we know who our provider is, and we, uh, we take joy in that. We pray that you would use us, Lord. Use us at this time to uh, help to further your kingdom, to spread the gospel message, and to be a blessing to those uh, who need it most. We pray that you would use us, that you would be honored, that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all, and uh, we'll look forward to live streaming again Sunday.